Good afternoon, and welcome to HIT Policy Update, the complimentary webinar from HealthSystemCIO.com, sponsored by OnBase by Highland. A little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of HealthSystemCIO.com, and I'll be your moderator today. We encourage you to ask questions, a great topic for questions. You can send them in at any time by typing them into the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Leave the default set to all panelists. We'll be looking at those and posing them later in the program. The down, you can download the deck at any time. You have the URL in front of you. There's a shortened URL at the bottom of all the slides, and I'll send it out in the chat box. And we are taping today's event, so there'll be an archive available. Usually within two business days, if not sooner, you'll get an email when it's ready and a separate <coughs> registration is required. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, we're going to go about 45 minutes. First, we're going to hear from Dr. John Halamka, CIO at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Then we're going to hear from our sponsor, represented by Lorna Green, Healthcare Executive Advisor with OnBase by Highland. Then we'll have our Q&A. So without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Halamka. There you go, Dr. Halamka. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks very much, Anthony. And since you're taping this, does that mean I can't say anything controversial? Oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have fun. So uh, as we usually do every quarter when we meet, we talk about the current state of regulation, legislation, and the industry at large. Lots going on this quarter. We have Meaningful Use Stage 3 recommendations. Take a quick look at those and recognize that there's a fair amount of controversy, that a lot of CIOs are just tired of the Meaningful Use Program, and they hope these are radically scaled back and that much fewer prescriptive requirements are made, maybe a few outcomes, maybe a few general goals, a much narrower focus. Take a peek at that. Since we last talked, remember, the sustainable growth rate fix was tossed out. That is, sustainable growth rate since 1997 has been yearly revisited by Congress. The formula that a doctor or hospital couldn't receive more payment increase per year than the rate of inflation never quite worked because of new therapies and new technologies, and so Congress would override every year. This year they tossed out a sustainable growth rate bill and replaced it with a really bold program for replacing fee-for-service with global capitated risk, pay for wellness, pay for outcomes, with 25% of Medicare reimbursements going to this risk-based approach by 2018. So that's going to really change a lot of the IT systems that we need because we're going to be paid for outcomes and quality, and measuring quality will be increasingly important. A lot of bills going on in Congress right now. We'll talk through those. Uh, a lot of anger because $29 billion has been spent on the high-tech program, and Congress isn't completely sure we've had our money's worth because we still aren't coordinating care. We don't have a learning health care system. We'll share with you some of the things they're up to, both in the House with 21st Century Cures and the Senate with the Health Committee, the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee debating some of the issues around health care IT. And then finally, talk through what is happening in the private sector and some of the exciting new things you're seeing coming out of some of our major vendors with application program interfaces, modules, and mobile apps. So first, the Standards Committee met last week and reviewed every line of the 731 pages of regulations proposed in the Notices of Proposed Rulemaking by CMS and ONC and had, you know, next see the next four or five slides, a series of recommendations to skinny them down, to focus on what's mature and achievable, to reduce burden on vendors, implementers, and payers and providers. So let's look at some of these ideas. So first, there's this general recognition that the world of interoperability is going away from the sort of 1990s, I'm going to take a payload of very complicated data and ship it from place to place asynchronously, and more to a, I will query the data from the EHR when I need it and be very discreet and atomic. You know, send me the allergies, the problems, the diet, the care plan, the care team, that sort of thing. The standards to do that, the Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources, FHIR, are all finished. They are available on the web at argonautproject.org for free. The test beds are free. Getting involved in the project is free. It's all happening very, very rapidly. 
Well, what we always say to our friends in regulatory agencies is regulating an emerging technology will only slow down that emerging technology. So I think we could directionally state this whole new kind of interoperability uh, using these new standards is absolutely the right direction, but it is just premature to put it prescriptively in a regulation at this time. There are a number of standards in the regulation that aren't ready for prime time, and there are those that will never be ready for prime time. And so one example of that is what's called Healthcare Provider Directory, or HPD. It requires the use of LDAP, the Lightweight Directory Access Protocol, across firewalls, which will never technically work. It just will never work, so don't even propose it. Uh, as an example of an alternative, David McCauley, who's at Cerner, over a weekend, wrote 300 lines of Python code and put up a national provider directory for the country. Uh, and it's the entire national provider database and it uses very simple Facebook, Amazon, Google-like technologies. It's web accessible. And then he was getting so many hits on his personal home computer, which hosted this, he moved it to Amazon for $15 a month. So here we have one guy in a weekend for 15 bucks builds a national provider directory. I don't think we need 1,000 page complex implementation guides or healthcare.gov all over again. So got to do some simplification of that requirement. The other couple of recommendations on the use of how to package payloads if you need to send them from place to place, which we're fine. And the suggestion that we use some administrative data standards, which are still evolving, they're a little early. So recommended against using that. We also did say that, again, rather than being prescriptive, that we know that standards alone are not enough to encourage interoperability. What you need is enabling infrastructure. You need policy. You need trust. You need a business case. You need participation agreements. So what we suggested is, you know, don't be overly prescriptive yet, but you know, there are a few kinds of what I'll call orchestration patterns that we believe are going to be increasingly common. We can signal that to the industry. Peer-to-peer, -peer, which means that I send you a payload or I query from you and we have a trust agreement between the two of us. Or what I'll call delegated authority. Um, Beth Israel Deaconess trusts John Halamka. The Mayo Clinic trusts Beth Israel Deaconess. Therefore, John Halamka has the ability to send and receive data from the Mayo Clinic. And the kind of work we've done with the Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources, you'll see at the ArgonautProject.org site, we also include this idea of peer-to-peer -peer data transport and delegated authorization using the OAuth approach that's so commonly used by Facebook and Amazon and HBO and everybody else. We think that'll work really well. Another kind of orchestration might be publish subscribe, which is I'm the primary care doctor and I will subscribe to all the events that happen in the community of my patients. So whether there's a lab result at Quest or there is a transition of care summary sent from some place, it always comes back to me and I'm the patient-centered medical home. And then the idea of decision support in the cloud, we think, is a good idea. It, standards aren't quite ready yet. A lot of emerging learning healthcare system precision medicine discussion, but that the idea that I could send data to a website and get decision support back, sending a question, getting an answer, is certainly something we think is going to be important in the future. Think, again, as we think of regulation, we should only use regulation where we really need regulation as a catalyst for change. So much is going on in the private sector now that we are advising that regulations be extremely thin, outcomes-based, and directional, not prescriptive. So some additional uh, recommendations that there are some emerging standards for the description of quality measures. If I want to say measure care and diabetics and I define a diabetic as has had a serum glucose greater than 300, or has had stereal hemoglobin A1C is greater than seven, or has retinopathy, neuropathy, and a diagnosis of diabetes, or is on insulin, whatever it is. I can define that in a Boolean logic statement, and you can then say, hey, EHR, instead of hard coding 
a specific numerator and denominator for a quality measure. Here is a logical description of how you compute the numerator and denominator. Use that. So we think this is a good idea because as quality measures evolve, it's going to be a whole lot better just to send a logical description of a numerator and denominator than to hard code every change. Again, that fire is a directional, important way of getting data in and out of EHRs. There are some emerging quality reporting standards, new revision just done that brings those to a level of maturity. We do think vocabularies like SNOBED and LOINC for certain purposes like problem lists and lab resulting are good enough and they should be in the regulation. We know that the CDA, the consolidated CDA architecture we use today needs a lot of work. Um, just, Anthony, to be honest, yesterday one of my hospitals sent a 1,094-page CCDA on an ICU patient between two hospitals. It was 1,094 pages of useless, completely unhelpful information. And we have to stop doing that. We have to constrain the CCDA so that it has just the data elements that are truly meaningful, useful in a transition of care. There's still some additional work to do on food descriptions as we think of not only allergies but intolerances and there's some emerging vocabularies for that. And then we also want to make sure that if any regulations are written describing a standard, we know standards are constantly in flux and evolving and so the regulation doesn't cast in concrete a specific version of a specific standard but says here is the current one and here we will accept anything that is subsequent to it that is an evolution of it so that when we want to adopt new technologies, we won't need regulatory change. We specifically rejected standards as not ready for prime time, or as I said, maybe never ready for prime time. There is something called the Healthy Decisions Standard uh, for incorporating decision support rules into an EHR. It's just not ready for use, never been implemented in the real world. We believe, of course, privacy and respect for privacy is incredibly important and must be something we continue to pursue. But data segmentation for privacy, which attempts to classify every data element in the medical record, so such things as mental health, substance abuse, sexually transmitted disease, domestic violence, these sorts of things, we today just don't have a robust standard by which we could flag with metadata every data element and then route it for a patient preference. So just way too early to incorporate that one. Our friends at CMS have wanted the electronic submission of medical documentation in the case of an audit. And we, of course, think that's a noble goal. It's just the standard called ESMD is not ready for prime time. And we know that in a future where all laboratories will be ordered fully electronically, it's important for a lab, Quest, a lab core, a hospital, to publish a list of tests it can run. And that's called the electronic delivery of service, kind of like a catalog of the lab tests that are offered. Great idea, just not ready for prime time. And finally, there's an NCPDP standard for formulary for which there is a better one coming that we waited on. So we just said, you know, guys, skinny down that notice of proposed rulemaking, throw out all of these standards here as not appropriate. There were some general recommendations as well made by our implementation and testing work group on easing the burden of meaningful use for everyone in our ecosystem. So we know the FDA is going to require a universal device identifier for every implantable device. We think that's a good direction, but requiring ambulatory use of that, well, the, often in the ambulatory environment, it's just not tracked, it's not part of workflow, it's not an obvious thing for the non-implanter, the guy who's in the primary care office to track. So we have to be careful about understanding that workflow. There was also a proposal to map immunizations to national drug codes. We don't think that's right. There's a vocabulary called CVX that meaningful use requires. It's far better. I talked about the constraining of the CCDA. Have to work on that. And there are a couple of certification requirements that, for example, require you to have focus groups of clinical end users for testing. And that it could be very, very burdensome um, on our whole industry. So. 
it's a little hard to define what a safe medical record is. I mean, Anthony, I know this is a very poor analogy, but you've heard it before. It's like when our friends in the Supreme Court define pornography. I can't tell you what it is, but I know it when I see it. So how do I tell you what a safe EHR or an unsafe EHR is in a way that is a precise definition? It's very challenging. And then finally, although I have glaucoma, I am absolutely a great fan of people who have visual or other uh, sensory deficits. There um, is in these guidelines to make our electronic um, records more accessible, a what's called level AA of these uh, criteria. The problem is there are no testing tools available yet. So how do you certify an EHR as compliant with something for which there are no testing tools? So probably a little premature. And uh, a few other things that we clarified um, that the, in the rule there was this requirement for uh, billing diagnoses and the word billing diagnoses relating to a specific encounter was very confusing. I already talked about the implantable device and the universal device identifier. We know that pharmacogenomic and biomarker standards are emerging again too early. Our friends in Congress, as we'll talk about in a minute, believe that interoperability means every data element from the one EHR should be exportable at no cost with no effort to another EHR. And we know that that concept is just entirely unrealistic. There are thousands of data elements in an EHR, many of which can't possibly be translated into the requirements of another EHR. So let's remove that particular section and maybe say something like a transition of care document representing the patient's major problems, medicines, allergies, and labs should be exportable and importable, but not suggest total data portability. And finally, I think we all know that when we come up with quality measures as a society, and then we change the EHR workflow for the purpose of calculating the quality measure and no other reason, let's say we decided that it's important to gather hair color and stratify diabetes by hair color, because we think blonde people are more susceptible to it, and that would not be used in any other clinical workflow except the quality measure, we shouldn't do that. Asking doctors to interrupt their workflow to key in more structured data for purely the purposes of getting to a quality measure is just not going to be justifiable given the time cost of doing so. So those were generally the standards committee recommendations. I mean, some in the press thought that they were controversial and combative, but I think you'll see they're all just generally reasonable. We're trying to reduce the burden of federal regulation. Well, $29 billion has been spent on high tech. Congress isn't sure it got its money's worth. So the House and the Senate are both actively writing bills. Well, I already mentioned the sustainable growth rate fix. That was probably generally good because, as I say, it moves us from fee-for-service to global capitated risk. And the idea there is, is that we will incent data sharing. We will incent quality reporting. We will incent different kinds of behaviors like home care, telemedicine, building urgent care centers and patient-centered medical homes in rural areas instead of expensive downtown ICUs because now hospitals and doctors will be paid for wellness. So that's, that's generally good. And as I say, you know, look for the fact that more and more iPhone apps measuring data about you in your home will become popular because it's cheaper to care for you in your home and keep you well than to hospitalize you under these new payment model ideas. 21st century cures, although largely uh, a pharmaceutical related uh, research and development kind of bill, includes a appendix uh, written by Representative Burgess of Texas that legislates interoperability. In effect, it makes it illegal to hold the data inside your hospital or doctor's office and not share it. And if you read through the bill, well-meaning people who are truly trying to fix a problem wrote it, but I think we all know that legislating interoperability doesn't make it happen. You need to make sure that there is appropriate business case, trust, infrastructure enablers, and not just to say, oh, gee, you want to send 
a piece of data across town to another doctor, if I legislate that you must do that, you will. Well, what if you don't have his address? What if you don't have any kind of trust relationship and maybe that person across town is actually a drug company selling patient identified data? You need a few other enablers first. So I've tried to advise the House that they need to really rethink that language. We'll see what happens. The Senate and the Health Committee seems to really understand that these issues are complex and that you just can't simply legislate interoperability. In fact, you may not need legislation at all, that what you do is you build such things as a sustainable growth rate fix, which is now going to give economic incentives to share data because you can't really survive unless you are doing care management and population health in a world of risk contracting, and that will make the data flow. So I think the Senate may very well not create legislation around interoperability. So I hope in the next 18 months, as the Obama administration winds down, what we see is actually diminished regulation and little, if any, legislation. We can hope. I just outlined some of the sustainable growth rate fixed elements there, and I just show you, for your benefit, the 21st century cures interoperability language and why it seems a little simplistic. Well, I promised to cover fire and what is going on with this fast healthcare interoperability resource. So what we did is recognizing that a meaningful use common data set has problems in meds and allergies and labs and diet and care plan and care team is we created what are called fire resources and resource is just a data element and we have made available in this open source standard as I mentioned at argonautproject.org 99 different fire resources with full open source specifications. Cerner, Epic, Meditech, Athena, eClinical Works, McKesson, uh, a few others have agreed to incorporate these 99 different resources into their products that are going to be released over the next year. There was a demonstration in HIMSS showing that you could get Cerner and Epic and Meditech to talk to each other in real time when it came to these 99 different resources. We also developed a specification for document exchange, like op notes, H&Ps, progress notes, and those sorts of things. So assume that what you get is this combination of very well-structured, very well-delineated data elements plus unstructured documents sent over the internet using plain old HTTPS with security and trust enforced by the OAuth protocol, a very simple way of securing web transfer data. You suddenly have the ability to write in a matter of hours sophisticated interfaces and data exchanges. So as an example, I was talking to Dave McCauley at Cerner this morning and he felt that some patients would want to exchange information from the PHR with a clinical trials database. And one of their programmers in eight hours wrote a system that enables a patient to transfer their medical data to a clinical trials database using this FHIR approach. It's so much radically simpler than any standard that we've had to date. We're going to see a whole new breed of applications come up that layer on top of the EHR. Our EHRs are basically transactional systems gathering data from doctors and hospitals, but they often don't provide decision support, unique visualizations, certainly don't really provide a lot of patient and family engagement beyond portals. So if you have, imagine these 99 structured data types being exchanged with an app that's trusted, whether that's issued by the institution or purchased by the patient through a third party, you're going to see a lot more of an ecosystem around EHRs evolve. You already have certain companies like Epic announcing its App Store or Athena having its More Disruption Please program. And every day I hear of new startups that are going to leverage this kind of technology to create new apps, layered applications and modules that sit on top of the EHR complementing the EHR and not replacing its transactional functions. So lots of movement there. We are in active testing 
um, with many vendors. As I say, you go to the uh, ArgonautProject.org site. You'll, uh, you can participate in testing if you wish. We've put up 3,000 patient records on the site. They're all, of course, completely fictitious and anonymized and that kind of thing for testing. And we're seeing an unbelievable groundswell of support in the entire IT industry for getting involved in the project, especially since anyone can participate. There's no restrictions, and it's free. So, Anthony, I know that was a whirlwind, but I'll summarize by saying meaningful use stage three, we're pushing back on, and hopefully we can constrain it. The legislative activity in Congress, the House seems a bit uh, simplistic, the Senate a bit more complex. Hopefully we'll see them and come out with very little additional uh, legislative um, material over the next couple of months. We are seeing that the, uh, in general, private sector is taking innovation back in its own hands, and that's very exciting. So as we head into the summer, there is no vacation. There is no rest. Uh, we continue <laughs> to push forward, and I'm very optimistic. Turn it back very to good. You. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Huamka. Excellent presentation, and looking forward to our Q&A. Uh, now we're going to hear from Lorna Green, who's with uh, OnBase by Highland, our sponsor for today. So I want to thank Lorna and welcome her to the program. Lorna? Thank you so much. And as always, Dr. Halamka, it's so good to hear these things put into real language with real words that we can understand. So thank you for that. I do work, I'm the nurse that works for OnBase by Highland, and traditionally OnBase is a company that handles enterprise content management. You know, in the old days, that would be being focused on scanned documents, medical records, that type thing. But as we've gone into the, the new era of healthcare, our company has a renewed emphasis on clinical content. We know that your core EMR, whether it's Epic on or Meditech, or Cerner, Allscripts, Athena, whoever it is, that is the core of your documentation. But we also know there are other pieces of content that are outside that EMR that your clinicians need to make good judgment on. And some, some of those are listed here. I won't read through all of them with you, but it would be photos and images and reports and that type of thing. But our goal at OnBase is to have the availability of any medical image anytime anywhere to any authorized user in context of the patient's record. It's very important to us that you go beyond the typical workflow that you have here, seeing that you've got your EMR open and maybe you're looking at an EKG and then you want to look at the tax system and your clinicians are having to go in and out and in and out of multiple systems. At OnBase, we have developed a product called our OnBase Patient Window, which works along with our VNA and our image viewer so that all of the outside content, anything that's not in the EMR, can be viewed from one location for your clinician. And depending on your EMR, it will connect to your EMR either by a direct link embedded in the EMR or through a, a key that they can get to. So your clinicians have one login to see all the content that they would want to see. And just to let you know of our commitment to the clinicians, in making our product more valuable is we have formed a physician and nursing advisory board, um, two separate boards. One has physicians, one has nurses on it. We met last week, and we go through our products and where we're going and our roadmap, and we get their input, their real-world input to tell us mm, that works or this doesn't work. And we really appreciate having the real-world input of people that will be using these products. The next thing I just wanted to mention briefly is in addition to that, we have developed what we call our healthcare mobility systems. And we're focusing on four different areas with mobility, one being the patient, the clinician, your registration staff, and then your administrators. We know that there's headaches with each one of those. And we have built some mobile applications. We're starting with the patient. They can do their registration form, sign consent, Moving on to clinical, where your clinicians can review those things, capture photos, input other data, and then on into administrative so that you can retrieve that information, use it for billing, and whatever else you might need to. We do support iOS and Android and BlackBerry in some of the, the modules that we have, but I just wanted to let you know that 
we really take content as an important aspect of our EMR, and we want to help you bring all the content into one place to make your clinicians have an easier viewing and diagnostic experience. This is just a list of what our, our clinical products are. We have an ARM-based patient window. We have medical imaging viewer. We now have an on-base DNA, and our on-base anywhere is a sharing between on-base um, customers of documents. We have a universal scope capture module and then the mobile solutions. So if we can help you in any way, want to talk more about what we can do, please give me a, a call or email me, and I would love to talk with you. Thank you, Anthony. All right. Thank you so much, Lorna, and thanks to OnBase by Highland for sponsoring these events. We really appreciate it. All right. Well, now it's time for our Q&A. As I mentioned, go ahead and send your questions in. Uh, in the Q&A box, leave the default set to all panelists, and we will take a look at those. So let's get started. Um, first question, when will the final 2015 to 2017 modification to MU2 be published? And of course, no one can ever answer that question, but I hear November. Um, November. Right, so I mean, yeah, that's what I hear, right? So. Um, no, one does not know exactly when the government will act and do its thing. Okay. Uh, that, that, I mean, those, I mean, I've been here in fall. Um, I've, I've heard all kinds of things, but yeah, obviously we will, we will get it certainly later this year. Okay. Next question. Do you believe it is possible to re to create a standard for care management records? Sure. Well, so what I mean by care management goes something like this. If we define that there's a protocol, a guideline, or a standard of care for a certain disease, we can take a look at the patient experience in a continuous way over their primary care, specialty care, hospital urgent care data, and ask if there's variation from that protocol and guideline. So when you say standard, imagine an architecture like this. At each transition of care, inpatient, outpatient, or ED, a set of data elements is sent to a registry. And that could be the patient-centered medical home or a care management medical record registry. And once in that registry, all the data is put into a standardized form. So you had vocabulary controlled problems and meds and allergies and labs and that sort of thing. And then rules decision support against those data elements will show where there are variations in care. So I think where we are today is uh, already in Massachusetts, I 10,000 times a day am sending transition of care documents to registries for this kind of purpose. At the moment, the rules that we are using to look for variation for, uh, protocol, from protocols or guidelines um, are proprietary. That is, they are not represented in any kind of standard form. So I think where we still have work to do is in how is it that we're going to take a corpus of data about a patient and send it to a web service and get back a, oh, here are the gaps in care analysis. That's more of an orchestration at the moment than a specific standard. So that's a gap. Very good. Can you talk a little bit more about what type of information you think physicians should be required to put in and what they shouldn't be? You mentioned, um, you know, something about blonde hair. Some data is, I guess, needed to be able to do large studies and see patterns. So I would imagine, you know, your point of view, which you explained, there's got to be the other side that is saying, well, you know, we need these data elements for to understand these particular things. So just talk more about that dynamic and how you, how you or why you've decided to come down where you have on that particular issue. Sure. So I believe that the future of medicine is team-based care. And that means that you have a doctor, a nurse, mid-levels, social workers, pharmacists, mom, you know, all kinds of people who can contribute to the record, including the patient. And so my sense is, is that meaningful use or any regulation shouldn't specify that any particular member of that care team must be the provider of the data, just that the data is gathered. And I think that there's a whole lot of data elements that we can actually gather from patients and families that will be very contributory. 
Um, some of it, of course, is going to be social history and family history, but other things would be subjective data, such as mood or mobility, or do you believe that your pain is more or less, that kind of thing. So I, my comment today was simply that we shouldn't create a workflow within an EHR purely for the measurement of quality, that it has to have clinical impact as well. Uh, but a corollary to that is all the data in the EHR should be entered by the most appropriate person to enter it. And that we shouldn't, as we think about the 15 minutes that a doctor has to see a patient, try to say, you must be compassionate and empathetic, never commit malpractice, hit 44 quality measures, enter 107 data elements, and keep eye contact with the patient, because that is not possible. <laughs> or at least very difficult. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to read a few of the points that you've made and see if we can talk a little bit more about them. Um, first one is we recommend it against adopting specific standards to enable broad generic data portability because of the complexity involved. Um, and that's exactly what uh, people in Congress want you to do uh, because they want it to be like different appliances that you plug into the wall, all the plugs are the same and all the wall outlets are the same but it's not quite that simple. Is, is that sort of where the two sides are coming from, one that, that sees it as it, it should be that simple, and you have to explain to them that it doesn't quite work that way? Right. So, of course, we believe that there should be a what I'll call core data set, and that core data set should be very transportable across EHRs and PHRs and registries and clinical trials and all the rest. It just... When you look at the average medical record, the amount of data that is incorporated about you could be time date stamps that are in a format that is completely incompatible with an external record system or metadata about things that are security based or some aspects of audit trails. And so the challenge is, is that saying as the 21st Century Cures bill does, the entire record must be exportable and importable without cost or significant effort is just unrealistic. We need to scope that down to something that is clinically appropriate, a core data set. That's doable. All right, uh, next question. Appreciating the specificity of LOINC, it is also difficult to match from hospital to hospital since there are seven data elements that contribute to the code. How would you predict this to be a workable standard in the future, or could the data be limited? Sure. So I think of LOINC as completely suitable for purpose for reporting a result. Because if I tell you I am a Quest and here's a serum sodium, whether you're a hospital or a doctor's office running EHRA or EHRB, you can receive and parse that and say, it's a sodium. I get it. <laughs> Where it's harder, and this is probably the nature of the question, is in ordering. Because if LOINC is overly specific, and um, I want a serum sodium, I'm not specifically ordering a serum sodium on a roach analyzer. <laughs> so mm -hmm. what needs to happen is that uh, a layer above LOINC, call it a you know, LOINC category code, needs to be created. So when I say serum sodium, and I'm ordering a serum sodium, I give you the latitude to run it on whatever machine you have. So that's why the Standards Committee said LOINC is perfectly ready as a result reporting vocabulary, but not quite ready as an ordering vocabulary. Okay. Next point you made is point number three on one of your slides. Accepting the idea of information blocking, but uh, accept the idea, but define it so narrowly that the legislation would apply only in egregious circumstances. Um, talk, uh, if you would, about, give us an example of an egregious versus a non-egregious circumstance of information blocking, quote unquote. Sure. So Congress believes that many organizations have chief information blocking officers. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they do is they just think of ways not to deliver data to clinicians who need it at competitive organizations or deliver it to registries or patients who want it. Of course, no such thing exists. Where I think there is subtle information blocking 
is that um, if there are transaction fees and, you know, maybe interoperability shouldn't be a revenue source for EHR vendors. And that's, that's you know, it's, it's a little hard for us to, as a society, decide what a revenue source can and cannot be, especially the transaction fees are 25 cents a piece or something like that. Where you do see what I could, I could call egregious information blocking is where a vendor announces that it will have support for a national standard, but never actually delivers it in the field. That there is a fundamental difference between the EHR they certified and what you actually find in the wild. And, um, you know, again, I don't think uh, I have a specific example I could share, but it would be interested in the, uh, the feedback of uh, your listeners. Have you ever seen an EHR that was fully certified Yet, when you went to implement in the field certain interoperability features, they weren't there. That would be an example of egregious. In effect, they faked certification, <laughs> and there should be a fine or penalty associated with that. What you deploy in the field should be exactly what you certified, if anything other than that is fraud. Well, that segues uh, well into the next question, uh, which may be our final one, unless we get another one to come in. Um, another one of your points, accept the idea of standards, bodies, contracts, uh, but reduce the funding and don't require adoption of the recommendations in certification. Talk a little bit about, um, you know, the point you just made about perhaps uh, someone gets certified and yet does not present to the market what they were certified for, um, and then your overall thoughts on standards body certification and uh, how that should play out. The standards bodies are consensus-based, and, you know, they are really working very hard. But I think what we found with the Argonaut Project and other projects I've led is that sometimes consensus-based standards have a problem, and that is if, for example, a committee elects to design a duck, you get a platypus. Oh, it's got to have a bill and fur and be a mammal and lay eggs. And what we end up with is these standards guides that have so much scope that it just is so burdensome to implement them that they're too expensive and too hard and they don't get adopted. So I think, as the Burgess bill suggests, we should just turn it over to the standards bodies and they'll fix everything is just not true. What we need is standards bodies are great, but they need to have governance. They need to have a, a, you know, a thoughtful group that's continually and ruthlessly constraining scope if we're going to end up with standards that are implementable at low cost, such that a 16-year-old over a weekend can write an app and not require a team of informatics PhDs. Well, uh, that is a great point to end on and a great presentation. And any event where we can bring up the fascinating platypus is a successful one to me. So um, with, <laughs> I want to thank uh, Dr. John Halamka for doing with us, uh, this with us again every quarter. I think it's quite a service to the industry. Um, and we appreciate On Base by Highland for making it possible and Lorna Green for continually speaking in these events. We appreciate her participation as well. As I said, you will receive a separate um, an email when our archive is ready and a separate registration is required. Uh, if you have the CHIME CHCIO certification, let them know you've attended to get your CEU. Sponsorship opportunities for events like these, contact Nancy Wilcox. Questions, comments overall, you can contact me. And you can go to our website to see our last 12 months of archived events and our upcoming events. And by the way, I've been working to put them all on our YouTube channel, so I will let everyone know when that is fully fully built out. We've got some events up there, but we're still working to get the rest of them up for the past year's events. So with that, I want to again, th again thank Dr. Halamka and Lorna and On Base by Highland, all our attendees, and everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you.